All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the Conversation of Money podcast. I hope you guys had an amazing weekend. So this is going to be a second week in a row where I've had a guest on the show. And for this particular one, I have someone that requires and demands your attention. And when I say that, I mean that seriously. He is a former, he is a former trader in London. In 2011, he was City's most profitable trader globally. So he really, really does know his stuff. He's also an inequality economist as well. So I'm going to introduce him in in a moment, but we're going to be talking about um, the importance of building wealth and what that actually means. I think a lot of the time in society, we misunderstand what that means. And he has a very, very unique take on what that means, especially with his background in the world of trading and financial services as a whole. So it is my great, great, great pleasure to welcome Gary Stevenson. Gary, welcome, mate. Thanks so much, Peter. Nice to uh, be on the show. So I know that I've given a very brief kind of like overview of an introduction to you there, but can you just give everyone kind of like a quick overview of, you know, who you are, where you started, how you became a trader, then we can get into the whole wealth creation. Because I think a lot of the times when people think of traders, they think of millionaires who came from uh, a privileged background with a silver spoon in their mouth. And for you, your story is very, very inspiring in the fact that it isn't that normal traditional journey. And your outlook and the way you put things is reflective of that experience as well. Yeah. So yeah, as you say, my background is not really the typical background of a trader, I guess. Yeah. So um, I'm from Ilford, which is in uh, East London. Um, And I managed to get into LSE, London School of Economics. I started there in 2005. Um, You know, LSE is like a sort of top university, but even once you get there, it's it's not easy to get a job as a trader. And um, everyone there was sort of writing a million applications to all the different investment banks. I didn't really know what I was doing, but um, I heard that Citibank used to hire one trader a year through, um, through a card game, which was mm-hmm. basically a maths game. And um, when I was a kid, I used to love maths and I, I used to do maths competitions and stuff like this. It's sort of like not the coolest thing, but it was my, my talent. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went in for this card game and I won. And um, I got a job basically as a trader, as an interest rates trader, short term interest rates trader for Citibank in London. Um, that started in June 2008 which uh, you'll obviously immediately know was a few mm-hmm. months before the, uh, the Lehman crisis, the, uh, yeah. the credit crunch. Yeah. Um, so yeah, things blew up pretty quickly when I was there. People in my team started to make or lose pretty huge amounts of money. Um, and I just sort of tried to get involved, tried to make as much money as I could, tried to understand why the interest rates move, how do they move. And um, I did quite well in the first couple of years. And uh, after um, a couple of years after 2008, like, I started to sort of really question this narrative because traders and economists had been predicting a big recovery every single year. Mm-hmm. Um, 2008, they said it recovered 2009, 2009, it recovered in 2010. And um, because I come from a sort of poor background, I couldn't really see things like the government money printing, like QE affecting ordinary people. And I couldn't see how that recovery mm-hmm. was going to happen. So I started to bet that because the measures weren't helping ordinary people, there'd be no recovery. And then through that, by the end of 2011, I became Citibank's globally most profitable trader, which was wow. pretty crazy. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I did it only really for sort of another year and a bit after that, um, because I, I, every time I looked at the economy and I had to put bets on, I thought, you know, things are going to be really bad because mm-hmm. the government, the economists don't have a handle on inequality. They're not dealing with it. So the future is going to be bad. And, you know, I kept betting the future was going to be bad. And I kept being right and I kept making a lot of money. And um yeah, after a year and a half, I just said to my boss, look, I can't do this anymore. Like, I think I need to actually try and tell people what's happening or try and do something about it. So, uh, see, so yeah, I quit. Um, then after that, I did a master's at Oxford, sort of talking to a load of posh economists wearing capes and they weren't that interested. And uh, yeah, now I'm out here making videos on YouTube, writing articles in newspapers, on websites, um, just trying to explain to people the importance of inequality, um, what's going to happen to the future of the economy and uh, yeah talking to people like you Peter and we're going to explain today some stuff about wealth I think it's like super important because having like traveled my journey from like a poor background to like having a very good job with rich people and making quite a lot of money myself 
Uh, I think there's a lot of ways in which ordinary people are misled and as a result, don't really understand what wealth is and how it works. Absolutely. Absolutely. And guys, I have to say right off the bat, sh- straight away, if you're not following on YouTube and you're not following him on his social medias, I will leave all of the links in the show notes. Definitely go and follow. One thing that I love about you and one of my followers um, tagged me in one of your videos on Instagram, which I think linked to your YouTube and the way you explain things is very, very simple so that anybody can understand that. And I, I resonate with that because I think with, within my experience in financial services as well, the industry is very good at making things overly complicated, unnecessarily so as well. And it's almost done intentionally because the industry wants to be seen as the experts. You have to go to them in order to do X, Y, Z. And I think breaking it down in very simple language is really important. And that's what you what you tend to do, which is why I was really interested to have you on this podcast. We've got a YouTube live and we've got another podcast as well that we're going to be recording. So this will be a bit of a series. To get kick this off then, what is the definition? Or actually, let's start here. What does society misunderstand about wealth and what wealth is? Okay, so I think for ordinary people, and you know, like I've said, I come from a very ordinary background. When they think about wealth and what it means to be wealthy, they're thinking about what job have you got? Because mm-hmm. for most ordinary people, that's the difference between rich and poor. You know, do you mm-hmm. have a good job or do you have a bad job? And in most ordinary people, that's where all the money comes from. Um, so people think about wealth, they think about their job, but, but your job is not wealth. Your job and your salary is a form of income. And there's a mm-hmm. big difference between income and wealth. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's explain what is wealth, basically. All right. So, you know, wealth is the ownership of assets that you've accumulated, right? And the, the, the most obvious manifestation of that in ordinary people's lives is do you own a house or not? Do you own a flat or not? Do you own the property that you live in? Some people do and, and other people don't and they have the rent. But even that is actually a very limited and limiting understanding of what wealth is. Because I think for ordinary people, especially nowadays, especially here where I am in London, it's so difficult just to get a house that we just think that's what I want. That's what I need. I want a house. Mm-hmm. And it's super important to get a house. And it's difficult if you don't have one. But if we just understand wealth as housing, that's super, super limiting, right? Because the what wealth is, is so much more than that, right? Walk down your high street, right? You see a massive supermarket, Sainsbury's, Tesco's. Somebody owns that. You see, I live here near Canary Wharf, right? There's a, a load of skyscrapers down there. Somebody owns those skyscrapers. You know what I mean? Somebody owns Lloyd's Bank on your high street. Somebody owns your local pub. Somebody owns all them restaurants, you know, somebody owns H&M, all of mm-hmm. these shops, right? And, you know, that's just in the city. You go out into the countryside, there's miles and miles of farmland, there's factories, you know, there's oil fields, there's, there's iron mines, you know what I mean? All of these things are owned. And I think for ordinary people who are just struggling to save up to buy a house, you don't think like, well, you know, who owns the, who owns the skyscrapers? Who owns the office buildings? Who owns the shopping mall? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You don't think that because ordinary people basically never get to own those things but they are all owned all of those things are owned everything everything you see when you go out there is owned even the schools the hospitals they're owned right so once you broaden your understanding of what is wealth and you start walking down the high street you start thinking somebody owns this you know somebody owns that shopping mall somebody owns this office building that you work in you know what i mean once you start realizing those things you realize wow there's there's a huge amount of wealth in the world that I don't own, you know, I'm sitting here now looking out the window. I can see the Shard in the distance, tallest building in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. Somebody owns that building. You know what I mean? But ordinary people never get to own these things. So the first, my first message is there's a huge amount of wealth, commercial wealth, shops, offices, factories, natural resources like land and mines and oil fields. And, you know, those windmills that give, give us electricity in the sea. These are all owned. Well, so listeners might be thinking, well, I don't know nobody who owns an iron mine. You know what I mean? I don't know nobody who owns a skyscraper. So who owns these things? And that leads us to my first big point, which is when we understand wealth, which is who owns the actual things in our world, in our country, in our cities, we realize that wealth is much, much more unequally distributed than income, mm-hmm. which makes sense in a way, because, you know, one person can only work one job. But one person can own huge amounts of property and buildings and natural resources. You know, if we look at Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, he's got 200 billion, you know, which is 200,000 million of assets of wealth. Mm -hmm. And that people sometimes I think 
visualize that as if Jeff Bezos has a bank account in somewhere, $200 billion in it. That's exactly not how it works, right? Very, very wealthy people do not have bank cash. accounts with enormous amounts of cash. Yeah. Well, I mean, they do, but not $200 billion yeah. of cash. What they yeah. own is resources. And those resources are real things that exist in the world and in this mm-hmm. country, right? They own buildings, corporate buildings. That might be your shopping center. That might be your supermarket. That might be office buildings. They own factories. They own land. They own natural resources. So there's, that's my message. There's this huge amount of real wealth in the world. It's not an abstract thing. It's not just money in the bank. It's real resources, buildings, natural resources, companies, hospitals, schools, things like that. And uh, it's very, very unequally distributed. And ordinary people who are often struggling just to own the home that they live in don't often realize what an enormous amount of wealth there is and how much that ownership is concentrated amongst a small number of largely very, very wealthy families and individuals. You, you make some really good points here. And so my, my background is, is very similar to yours in terms of not from a wealthy background at all. So you tend to like kind of work your way up and, you know, you get earned good money and income. You're right. Income is just income. Wealth is very, very different. And you've alluded to the fact that now we have a whole generation of people who are struggling just to get the deposit for their, for the house that they will eventually own. And that will be in most cases for most people, the biggest asset that they own during their lifetime. So once you own that property, you've got your your foot on the ladder, as it were. You're right. It's very, very difficult then to put your head above the parapet to see actually that there's all this other stuff that you could be part ownership in. My question is, though, it's probably going to be twofold for this in follow up. How much of a role do you think, number one, education has to play in the fact that, number one, there is this misunderstanding of what true wealth is? And do you feel that there are actual barriers that are, that are practically and uh, tangibly put in place of people attaining assets in order to build real wealth on, in the long term? That's a very, very good question, because um, you're kind of capturing here that there's basically two sides to this, basically, which is um, one, people are misled and people are not understanding what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other side, we have a system that actually makes it very, very difficult for ordinary people to get some of that wealth. You know what I mean? So there's, there's this educational problem, this individual problem, and there's also this systemic problem. So all right, let's first talk about understanding. Why do people not understand? It? I mean, obviously, they're not taught in school. You know, people like yourself and, you know, I do the same thing. We put videos out on YouTube trying to educate people on what's happening. That's super important. But what, one thing to make clear is, you know, I go out and I do a lot of campaigning saying, look, the super, super rich are unbelievably rich. If they don't pay taxes, we've got to pay it. It's going to affect us. It's going to affect our society. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, a lot of these super rich people, obviously, they don't agree with my message. They don't want to be taxed more, right? But And they, they, own, and they own things they, as well. They, and, you know, some of those things they own include, you know, newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like recently, <laughs> yeah. recently, Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post, right? And then suddenly, <laughs> the Washington Post is putting out articles like, oh, we shouldn't tax the rich. You know what I mean? <laughs> Jeff yeah. Bezos being rich is good for you. And, you know, look at who owns, look at who owns the Times, the Telegraph, the Daily Mail. It's all super, super, super rich people, right? So they're mm-hmm. sending out messages to people saying, well, the classic one, which you see in all the newspapers is, oh, this guy he stopped drinking coffee at Starbucks. He stopped eating avocado toast and now he's got a house. And they want to send this message to you that the reason why young people, and to be honest, it's, you know, this message is actually aimed at like older people saying the mm-hmm. reason that young people can't afford property is just because they're lazy. Because yeah, they're, because they're eating money. avocado toast. Yeah, yeah. And look, you know, of course, like, you know, you have young listeners out there and they know that's a joke, but that message goes out to their parents. And then their parents don't realize we're creating a system where it's so difficult for younger people. And, you know, then that represents older people might not, vote for parties that want to make things fairer or they might not support systems to make things fairer or to increase taxation on the rich so obviously you know i make videos saying tax the rich you know i don't get no funding from richard branson for that you know what i mean i don't get no funding from <laughs> murder but the super billionaires they fund think tanks that say don't tax the rich you know so they send messages out there just telling people look just work hard and you'll be fine and 
then they want you to spend it all in um, Louis Vuitton. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because they, what they want is your assets. You know, they want to own the things that you want. And that, that's not because rich people are evil or rich people are terrible. I, I totally don't believe that. But, you know, I've been poor and I've been rich. And the fact is, once rich people have very high levels of wealth, that generates a huge More. amount of income. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And that, that is the sort of the second key point that I want to make that I want people to understand is that once you own wealth or own large amounts of wealth, that starts to generate an income. And that income can be enormous, right? And, you know, for ordinary people that, you know, might be trying to save up 20 grand, 50 grand, 100 grand, if they're lucky to buy a house, those are not going to generate huge amounts of wealth. But very wealthy people, you know, if somebody's got 2 million pounds, that wealth will generate an income. Maybe if you've got 2 million pounds, you'll probably be generating 50, 60 grand a year off that 2 million pounds. Mm -hmm. If you've got 10 million pounds, well, you'd be making like 300 grand a year, right? Mm -hmm. If you're Jeff Bezos, he's got $200 billion, then he's probably (laughs) making, he's making about $6 billion a year, right? What is that? That's something like $20 million every day or something Mm -hmm. like that, right? Mm -hmm. So once people become very rich, they generate huge amounts of income, not by working, just because they own those assets, right? And, you know, if you were making 300 grand a year, just for getting out of bed because you own wealth, because you own assets. And remember, that's real things, properties, supermarkets, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. office buildings. Well, what will you do? You know, if you're making 300 grand a year without working, you're not going to spend 300 grand a year. You're going to spend 100 grand a year. You can live a great mm-hmm. life spending 100 grand a year. Mm-hmm. And you're going to use that 200 grand to buy other assets. So and that's, they, what, and that's what they do. And that's what exactly, they do. hundred percent. That's they what they do. You know, and reinvest. Yeah. And that's what, you know, that's what I do. You know, I, I made money trading and now I'm relatively wealthy and I'm, I'm an investor and I spend the part of what I make, I live off it and the rest I invest. You know, that's, it's not the rich people are evil. It's just that they're rich right? because once you are rich, you generate a huge income and then it's very easy for you to purchase assets. But the problem is ordinary people who don't have that wealth need those assets too. And the most obvious example of that is housing. But it's important to understand that income that they make, it don't come out of thin air. So when you go to Tesco, some of that money goes to the workers in Tesco, but some of it goes to the dude who owns Tesco and the dude who owns that building. You know what I mean? And this is the same for every single thing that you do. When you go to the barbers, right? Some of your money goes to the barber and some of the money goes to the owner of the building. And when you work, when you go to work in an office building, some of your wage goes to the owner of that building. So, and you know, you see this all the time. So the money that goes to your mortgage, it don't disappear. It goes to the owners of the mortgage. The money that goes on your rent, it don't disappear. It goes to the owner of the property, right? So when you have this large amount of inequality in wealth, it generates a massive flow of income from ordinary people who need to live in those houses, who need to eat the food, who need to go to the supermarkets, who need to pay for their bills. That goes to the owners of the assets, right? So it creates this massive flow. So the system as it is, it works really, really well for the rich and they want you to be happy with it and accept it. And they don't want you to really know. I think they're really happy with people not realizing that they own the skyscrapers and they own mm-hmm. the shops because otherwise people would say, hey, like, why don't we get a share of this? Mm-hmm. Why can't mm-hmm. we own a bit of this? You know what I mean? So, of course, they're like totally happy with things being this way. And as it goes, ordinary people get their wages. They give it to those rich guys and the rich people use it to buy ordinary people's houses. And then mm-hmm. ordinary people's kids can't buy houses. So that, mm-hmm. that's the problem. Um, so, yeah, um, definitely there's an the informational problem. You know, that's why I'm here. You know, that's why you do what you do. Um, but there's also a systemic problem. But then, you know, you also sort of ask the question of, you know, what can what can people do? Um, you know, I think a big part of what you do and like, so what we're talking about today is people need to understand that wealth's out there. You know, I always call for systemic change, but, you know, this is an investment channel you talk about investment mm-hmm. advice so if people understand that wealth exists um that it means that wealthy people generate an income from the rest of us then they need to do what they can and i'm saying this with a total understanding of how difficult it can be and how difficult it is for ordinary people they need to understand that your only way to get yourself to financial security of course, you do need to get a good job if you can. And you need to try and get your kids in a good job if you can. Yeah, because you need the income. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, invest, you can't yeah. get the wealth until you have the income. It's not, mm-hmm. you're not going to get it out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. But then once you have that income, yeah, you need to look towards doing what they do, building wealth. And, you know, the first thing for most people is, as I've said, as you've said, get that property, get that ownership. And it's important to understand if you get a property with a mortgage, you know, if you own like a 300 grand property and you've got 250 grand mortgage, really effectively, the rich guy's still on your house because, you know, <laughs> yeah. they own like five, six of your house, right? So get yeah. that property, pay the mortgage down, get that financial security for yourself. Try and do that for your children, you know, and that's, um, it's difficult, but that's what you need to do. But, you know, this balance, and we'll talk about it more, is 
what I always talk about is we have this systemic problem where because we're allowing the rich to get so rich, it's pushing house prices up. And that's meaning ordinary people go and get houses. Often ordinary people are selling their houses. That's creating a systemic problem, which I think we need to look at how we can deal with it politically or using our pressure as a group to enforce the policy. Because, you know, we have in this country, the chancellor, Rishi Sunak, his dad is literally a billionaire. Mm-hmm. And remember, a billionaire is not a millionaire, right? A billionaire mm-hmm. has 1,000 million pounds, right? <laughs> yeah. That's an insane amount of money. Um, so he doesn't want the rich to pay more taxes. You know what I mean? But if we don't make them pay more taxes, then we got to pay the taxes. Mm-hmm. And if we got to pay the taxes, then we ain't going to be able to afford to buy houses. So yeah, it's a balance. Yeah. So this, 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 I've got so many questions swirling in my head right now. Um, before I get on to the, like the whole tackling the systemic issue, because I think that there is something there and, and there are common arguments that you will see that the politicians will always throw out there uh, specifically. Before we get onto that, I'm interested to know your thoughts on the state of social media in this equation of information, education around what wealth really is and the fundamental steps that it takes in order to get yourself on the ladder, on the road to creating wealth. I hate social media and people call me an influencer and I hate that word because there is so much nonsense out there that is very, very, it's, it's almost like over-sexualized in the, in the contextual sense of information and, and clickbait, thumbnails, all this kind of stuff, where it is information that is overly simplified simply to attract the, the, an appeal to the greed in people. But at the end of it, it's only there literally to make another person more money because of the falsehoods of what wealth and the perception of wealth is in today's society with social media. And that's something that I struggle with being on YouTube. I struggle with being on Instagram. I constantly question myself whether I'm actually adding to the, the noise how do you find it when you see, you know, traders specifically on, on Instagram, you know, in front of Bentleys and all this kind of stuff and they're young kids and they're, they're portraying this lifestyle to appeal to other people like them, but really without any real substance and real know-how on how to get people there. I think you've captured it very well there, Peter. Um, it's, um, it's a crazy world out there on social media. And it's the thing is, look, you spoke about education, right? I understand young people are coming out into this world and, you know, they've been taught Shakespeare in school and they ain't been taught nothing about personal finances, right? So then they're coming out and then they're, they're living in a world that's going to pay them 20, 25 grand a year and a house costs 600 grand. <laughs> and, um, you know, and then they're seeing people go off, going off and working in the city and making a million quid a year. And, you know, they're seeing, people on instagram saying oh, i made a million pounds on bitcoin or you know i can guarantee making money trading on the internet and you know they're watching movies a wolf of wall street american psycho and big short and uh you know they're seeing bitcoin advertised on buses and everyone's out saying they made so much money on it and i think like in a world where if you're just an ordinary person and you just want to work hard and get like a, a place to raise a family you know, my dad worked for the post office for 35 years, right? And he's got a house. Now. You can't do that nowadays. Mm-hmm. So in a world where ordinary people, young people, young men and women who just want to get financial security, they can't do that by taking a sensible route. And then suddenly they're bombarded by things like you say, some dude on Instagram with a Lamborghini saying it's easy. They're thinking, oh my God, I'm an idiot. I, I need to get involved mm-hmm. with this. You know what I mean? If I'm and, not doing this, I'm a loser. That's almost yeah, like... But, yeah, but not even... The, the thing I want to add to that is that we've made it so difficult to get even financial security. You've taken the sensible route. You know what mm, I mean? Because mm. work isn't working. And you know, like if you make the sensible route work, then the sensible people will take it. But we've created a world where increasingly the sensible route is not working for young people. You know what I mean? I get messages from a lot of young men, especially saying, look, I don't know how I'm going to get a house. I don't know how I'm going to get family. You know what I mean? So then when you create such financial insecurity, then people are vulnerable basically and then you see people popping up on social media and i think some of them some of some of them know they're taking you for a ride but other people really they're just they're just in it for hype like they they, they see it's mm, working mm. because they they they're putting out messages and 
people are loving it. You know what I mean? And the big thing that is coming up at the moment, well, there's two big things. One is crypto, but the thing which as a former trader, I'm more equipped to talk about is online trading. Mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. is being advertised to people really, really aggressively, right? And um, there's a massive increase in, in it. Like IG index users nearly doubled, free traders users up about 300, 400%, millions of people using eToro. Like, and you used to YouTube it and people are like guaranteed strategy to make money. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I see messages on Instagram of people like posting all their trades, right? Um, is it right if I talk a little bit about one? Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to mention them by name, right? Go for it, go for it, go for it. So... <sighs> Well, first of all, at the beginning of COVID, I put some articles out, right? Saying, oh, I think these things are going to happen. You know, my mm-hmm. job is a trade. That's why I made some market predictions. Mm-hmm. I said, I think stock prices will go up, gold price will go up. This was about 18 months ago. And um, those things happened. And a lot of people contacted me, right? And people saying, I don't know what to do. And I told them, you can, you can bet on these things if you want. You know, maybe that was a bit, you know, irresponsible of me. But, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't in the investment game at that mm-hmm. point. So, like, okay, people jumped in. And... Um, a lot of these guys lost money. And I was like, how did you manage to lose money, right? Like, I gave you good because advice. Because they, they, they don't understand the risk management side to it, though. Well, what it is, is they get dragged into this social media world and people tell mm-hmm. you it's easy, do this, do that, bet on this, bet on that, right? And um, this guy sent me, like, a, a picture that he got from a guy's following on Instagram, right? And the guy has posted, like, 10 trades and he's trading gold, right? And he's, he's made money on every trade. And what he's doing is he's selling gold at, like, 1728 dollars 1728 and buying it back at 1727 okay Mm -hmm. which is like the tiniest tiniest little move right and Mm -hmm. like these prices move up and down all the time so if you're literally waiting for that 0.1 percent i think it's even less than 0.1 percent move Mm -hmm. you'll probably get it right and he's done that 10 times right and each time he's done that he's made 500 dollars and he's made five thousand dollars all right and he said it's easy i make money every time right and I was thinking, how has this guy managed to make you $500 on such a tiny, tiny, tiny little move, right? So I did the maths. Each single one of them trades was worth £600,000, each one of them trades, right? This is the thing and- that they don't show, though. That's, and that's the thing that frustrates me. They'll show, oh, these are the profits that I've made. But okay, how much money have you put on the line? Especially if you exactly. leverage this stuff, you're in debt if it goes the wrong way. That's the and thing what these guys are doing. See yeah. yeah, they put massive, massive bets on things that are 99% likely to happen. And then you make like 100 quid, right? And, but in that 1% where it doesn't happen, these guys could lose half a million pounds. Mm. They're, they're risking half a million pounds to make 100 pounds and by betting on something that's almost certain. You know what I mean? When and you, you know, you like could do that, this. It's insanity. Really, when you, put you it could like do that, this crazy. in sports betting, right? Like you could wait until Liverpool are like 3 0 up and then bet a million pounds on them to win and you win 50 quid. And you could do that every single week, right? But that's what mm-hmm. that's essentially what they're doing, right? They're, they're looking at things that are almost certain to happen and betting a million quid on it. And then if you do that, of course you'll win again and again and again and again and again, right? But you'll win 50 quid each time. And what happens when you lose? <laughs> and it's in, and, but of course, like, people watching it you know some of these guys are like 18 quid betting their student loan money 18 Mm. years old betting their student loan money right and they don't know they just see here's a guy with a lamborghini with gold chains say Mm -hmm. listing 20 trades making 20 trades all winning saying i'm making 10 grand a day you know what i mean Mm -hmm. but it's i mean you know you know the fsa the fca the financial regulators can't go and regulate every guy on instagram but like if you understand what's happening, it is insane what some yeah. of these guys are selling. It is totally yeah. insane. And I worry, I worry. And, you know, like, you know, we got put in touch on Instagram. And, like, the first thing I did, I had to look at your videos and we had a talk, right? Because I worry there's a lot of guys out there that are giving such irresponsible advice. You know, and I saw that the stuff you did was, was good advice. But, like, how do the people out there know? Like, it's, it's man, it's a difficult world for the ordinary people. And that's, that's what I that's what keeps me going it's like i watch videos sometimes and i've stopped now because it used to anger me and i used to get really frustrated like some of the nonsense that people spew and i'm like okay so if you're an 18 year old just start you know you you've popped onto onto youtube you're gonna find all these videos and you have no idea what's real what's wrong what's incorrect what's factual what's fallacy you have no idea you're just gonna go with the one that's telling the best story and i think it linked really nicely into this conversation around you know the importance of building wealth because now we can get into the real nitty-gritty we know that obviously there's that educational gap and you and i are trying to plug and provide as much education as we can in our own mediums However, the larger issue is systemic. So how do we go about actually making those changes? Because the politicians will say, well, if you tax the wealthy more, 
what they'll basically do is they'll just move their companies and they'll move abroad. And then you'll have a whole load of the population, 20,000, 10,000 people, however many people they employed, unemployed, there'll be a burden on the tax system. And therefore you then have, or the benefit system. And then you have to try and get those people back into the workforce. But if those people are not employing because they've moved their businesses, it's futile, you're going around in circles. So how do we go about systemic change? Where do we actually begin? You know, I was talking to a friend about this the other day, right? And this friend of mine, he, he works for the government and he used to work in like counter-terrorism. You know what I mean? And um, we were talking about this, look, if you tax them, they'll leave and it's not going to work. And um, what I said to him was, look, if we don't tax these guys, then what we are looking at is a slow motion economic disaster for the people mm -hmm. of this country and for the people of this world, right? So... What he said was actually like this is similar to what I do because look, it's not easy to stop terrorism. It's not easy to stop terrorists. But if we don't do it, it's a disaster, right? So we have mm -hmm. to try and do it, right? And it's the same with taxing the rich, right? It's not easy to tax them. They own the newspapers, they've got the best tax accountants, they're super, super rich, they're super, super powerful. But if we don't find a way to tax them, then they will increasingly own more and more and more of the wealth in this country and in the world and, and this planet. And that will mean our lives will get worse and worse and worse. So, you know, you can look at other countries or other times in history in this country where inequality is very, very high. And what are the outcomes like for ordinary people? They're yeah. always very, very, very bad, right? And it's no coincidence that if you go back and look, when people say it's impossible, I always say, well, actually we did it, we did it. If, if you study a bit of history, you'll see after the second world war, Basically, all the countries of Europe decided, look, we're not going to do this no more. We demand that the governments and the wealthy pay for good education, good health care, good housing, so that people can live good lives, right? And because all the countries did it together, there was nowhere for the rich people to run to. You know what I mean? And, you know, we're in a similar situation here now, right, where things are getting worse for ordinary people and ordinary families in this country. But it's not just in this country, you know. I used to live in... Japan, uh, Japan is a, is, a, is a relatively equal country, but it's going the same way. You know, mm -hmm. the USA, things are getting worse and worse for all the people, yeah. but it's the same in France, Italy, Spain. It's all the big countries, right? So it's happening everywhere. And I think COVID is a really good opportunity in a way, right? Obviously, it's a terrible thing that's happened, but it's making the situation worse for every country in the same way. And it's making it more obvious that we need to work together. Countries need to work together. And um, look, if we don't do something it will be a disaster. I don't do this because I think it's easy. I do this because I think it's necessary. It's necessary, right? yeah. So it's a question of like, there's a necessary thing. If you don't do it, there'll be a disaster. It will be difficult. It will require probably international cooperation. It will require lots of people to work together, to push the power pool, to push the politicians to do it. But if you don't do it, we're losing our houses. Your kids are losing your houses. Your grandkids will, will be poor. They'll not have good quality houses. They'll not have good quality jobs. So... So, yeah, of course, 100% it's difficult. And, you know, I'm not going to do it by myself on YouTube. But if enough people get behind me and start doing their own thing and start realizing, look, we need to push for this. We need to push for more equality of wealth, equality of opportunity. Then it can happen. And it was done after the Second World War. But look, it's not going to be easy. And, you know, I don't know whether we're going to win or not. But I know that I'm going to fight for the side that's trying to make things better. What do you think? Because... I've always had a look at this and I've always kind of struggled and I, I appreciate it, but I understand that it is, it is the source of all kinds of worries and troubles, including the one that we're talking about today. Capitalism. That because is the big word. Because it, <laughs> yeah. it is. Capitalism enables the Jeff Bezos and an Elon Musk to acquire the wealth that they have. What does it say about capitalism? All right. So like... As you know, I worked in a bank for a long time. And then I went to Oxford University, I studied economics, right? And it's only really in the last sort of one and a half years, I've been started to be sort of seen as, portrayed as an activist in a sense. I mean, I suppose that's what I am, right? Like I'm pushing for less inequality, a fairer tax system, a better economy. So yeah, I suppose I'm an activist, right? And because I'm pushing for more equality, I get drawn into sort of left-wing activist circles, this kind of thing. I never really viewed myself as a particularly left-wing guy. I worked for a bank, like I spent a long time trying to make a lot of money. <laughs> you, I'm an you'll economist. be the opposite of what they would expect. Yeah, but like, um, to be. Yeah. but we have a common cause, which is you want more inequality. We want more equality, we want less inequality, right? But um, sometimes these guys say things like capitalism is the problem, capitalism is a broken system. And um, basically my worry with that is, it's not specific, is it? Like, let's say like your car mm -hmm. wasn't working and you took your car to the garage. And the mechanic said, 
your car is the problem. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you're like, yeah, look, yeah. Look, look, I know my car is the problem. <laughs> Tell but me what? how to fix it. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and like, look, I'm an economist, all right? I, three years at LSE, two years at Oxford. I was one of the top traders in the world, one of the biggest banks in the world. I've spent years and years looking at this problem. I'm telling you specifically what is wrong here. What is wrong is inequality of wealth. That's not inequality of income. This is not about doctors and lawyers and Lionel Messi, right? This is about super, super wealthy families accumulating all the wealth and taking our wealth, right? And it's about a tax system that doesn't tax them and does tax us. That is specifically the problem, okay? Now, you can have a capitalist system that has fair taxation. You know, we don't have it, but you can have it. You can have a capitalist system that does not have extreme inequality. We don't have it, but you can have it. Like, for me, these big words like capitalism... Look, the system that we have is a capitalist system and it has problems, but we can fix them problems, okay? So let's fix them, you know what I mean? And then, you know, I, you know, I consider myself to be a capitalist, right? But this system, for me, capitalism is a system where if you work hard, you do your things, you study hard, you work hard, you make money, you get a house, you get a good job, you get financial security. But that's not happening, is it? What's happening now is you get a house if your dad had a house, you know what I mean? Yep, really, yep. this is not a capitalist system. This is not a meritocracy. This is more like a, a feudalist system from the Middle Ages where how rich you are is basically about how rich your dad was or how, even how rich your granddad was, you know what I mean? So like what I want, and you can call it capitalism, you can call it socialism, you can call it whatever you want. I want an economy where if you work hard, you make your money, where if you work really hard, you can be rich. That's what I want. I want, mm -hmm. I want a society that, an economy that gives people the opportunity to have a good house. Or if you want to just do your thing and get financial security, as long as you're willing to, to do your work and try hard, you can get that. That's what I want. I want an economy that works. And, yeah. you know, I want a capitalism that works. I, yeah. I don't want a capitalism that is about who your dad is. That's yeah. which is what we've got now. And, yeah. you know, personally, for me, I don't think it is capitalism. Yeah. Now, you, you did it. I've, I've been looking while you've been speaking for you explain this beautifully in terms of the cycle of what happens with obviously COVID and this whole wealth cycle. And you broke it down beautifully in a video on YouTube. I've been trying to find it in, in the background whilst you've been speaking. I can't find it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to link it in the um, description, the show notes of this podcast. But anybody listening, you need to go and watch that video because it breaks down everything that Gary just said beautifully there in terms of the cycle of how this wealth and how this money circulates and how it feeds the wealthy people even more, particularly with everything that we've just been through with COVID and furlough, it's it's a cycle that is broken and we need to reconnect those dots so that we've got something that is sustainable moving forward. And I just, as you were saying that, it reminded me of that video that you made. And I think it's, yeah, I agree 100% with what, yours, with what everything you just said there. Yeah, the, the COVID thing is, is cause the way that I made my money. I studied economics before I went into the city, right? And if you study economics at university, there's nothing about inequality, basically. Then I went into the city and these guys who are almost all from rich backgrounds are constantly saying things are going to get better next year. Things are going to get better next year. Things are going to get better next year. And they, and they weren't getting better next year. And, you know, I came to the conclusion that this is because all of the money that was being poured into the economy, and there was a huge amount back in 2008, and there's a huge amount now, it wasn't going to ordinary people. It goes to rich people. And, you know, okay, rich people got more money. Well, rich people, if they get more money, they don't really spend it because they're already rich. They don't need mm -hmm. to spend more, right? And so they just use it to buy houses. Well, that actually makes ordinary people worse off, you know? So I'm, all, and then I started betting that because we're not fixing inequality, we wouldn't fix the economy, right? So whenever anything big happens in the economy, I think my extra value added is I look at what's going to happen to inequality and what's that going to mean? And that's why at the beginning of COVID, it was a crazy thing that happened, right? Because it looked like nobody was losing, right? Because loads of people lost their jobs, but the government gave them money, money, right? Yeah. And then I could see the government pouring this money into the system. And I was like, well, who's getting that money, right? Okay, well, ordinary people who can't work are getting that money. But they're no richer than they were pre-COVID, right? Because that money is just replacing what used to be their wages, right? So all this money is getting poured in. The people who are getting it are no richer. So who's richer? Oh, and I was, I was thinking about this for ages. Like, well, where's actually is the money? Okay, well, the money that they got was coming from the companies. So maybe the companies are richer. But the companies weren't richer in COVID because they lost their customers. Mm -hmm. So actually, the money was sitting with the customers, right? It was the customers who weren't spending, but were still keeping their income that were getting richer. But not all customers, right? Because if you're spending, like most people, is largely on essentials, 
rent, food, bills, you ain't accumulating money. It's only if your spending is largely on luxuries, you're accumulating mm-hmm. money. So who has very large spending on luxuries? It's richer people. Wealthy people. people yeah. yeah, exactly. So when, uh, then I figured, bam, what's going to happen is we're going to see a massive increase in the size of the bank accounts of wealthy and higher income people. And I called that at the beginning of COVID. And I said, well, wealthy and high income people spend on property, stocks and shares. So what you're going to see is property go up and stocks and shares go up. And I was saying that back in the beginning of March because I could see, I was analyzing it from an inequality perspective. I could see that it was the rich were going to make the money. That's what they were going to do. And obviously everyone at the time was saying, it's going to be an economic disaster. Stocks will fall, houses will fall. And I was out there saying these things will go up. And um, yeah, yeah, in the end, it's been right. You, you've made an interesting point, which um, I, I want to circle back to. And I wonder, I don't know whether you thought about this, but as you were saying it, I was like, I think you have a very unique perspective because of your background and like where you grew up. Like you, you said that the the wealthy guys in the in 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 the bank at the time who were trading were predicting that things were going to get better. You were looking at it from a point of view where actually no, it's not. And I wonder whether you've maybe contemplated the fact that maybe they were just thinking about it's going to get better for me and my socioeconomic yeah. group. <laughs> I think it's not it's, everybody um, else. Yeah. <laughs> but you're looking at it from, hang on a second. I'm from my social economic group, people in my group, it's not going to get better. It's yeah. going to get worse. And that's been the source of your success. This is, it's so interesting, right? Because if you're a trader and you are right when other people are wrong, you can make a lot of money, mm-hmm. right? A lot of money, right? And, you know, that's how I made my money, right? So these guys sitting in the bank predicting whether things will get better. You know, I was back there in 2011, but it went on, right? So in 2009, they said it would be 2010. 2010, 2011, 2011, 2012, 2012, and every single year. And even if you go back to the beginning of 2020, they were still saying it will get better later this year. Every single year. That's like 12, 13 years. It's insane. It's as if you watch the penalty shootout and all 20 players hit it off for a throw-in on the left side. It's like, how can you guys be so bad? Right? It's, like, it's, it's amazing. It's honestly amazing. And... um. Uh, I've thought about it for a long time. Like, how can they be so wrong? How can they be so wrong? And um, I think what you're saying is a big part of it, right? It's, but it's not conscious. The fact is, mm. nowadays, you know, it's not just, it's just that these guys come from rich families. They went to private schools, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, similar schools all over the world. You know, all their circle is rich families. You know, these guys, they don't know anyone poor. They never even really <laughs> met anyone poor, right? So, and yeah. you know, it's the same at the universities, right? So then they're sitting there, you know, pockets bursting with cash and they're saying, of course, things are going to get better because yeah. they can't see anything else. And, you know, we live so much in a world that is divided now where ordinary people from ordinary backgrounds, they never mix with these people. They can't get into the same universities. They can't get the same jobs. So these guys in these places, in these elite jobs, they're kids, basically. They've got no idea. They have no, like, how can you be an economist when you only know what life is like for 1% of people in the richest countries in the world? Yeah. And that's the top 1%, by the way, you have no idea what it's like for the remaining 99% of the yeah, population. Yes. So they're, they're, and it's honestly, it's, it's, it's unbelievable how bad people used to message me saying, like, oh, I'm going to get a mortgage. Should I get a fixed or a tracker? Right. And these fixed mortgages are set the same way right they ask the traders are interest rates going to go up which is basically is the economy going to recover mm-hmm. and the, the traders always say it'll go up right so then people are saying oh should i get like a five-year tracker at like three and a half percent i've seen in the daily mail that interest rates are going to go up and i tell them look don't get the i don't get the fixed rate because rates ain't never going to go up and they're like but the newspapers are all saying it and then you know and then I say, just get the tracker because rates won't go up. And they come back to me in six months saying, how did you know? But then the, thing, the ironic thing is this, though. The newspapers are saying it owned by the rich guys that when they set the fixed rate with the assumption that interest rates are going to go up, you're putting more money in their pocket yeah, anyway. But, and it's but that you know what? cycle. I think it's even worse than that. I think it's literally these guys who all went to the same schools, who all went to the same universities, who are always patting each other on the back, telling each other how smart they are. They literally just don't realize what they're doing. Like I went to Oxford and I said, what, said to the professor, you know, why have you guys predicted interest rates wrong for 10 years? And he said to me, no, that's not right. We haven't predicted it wrong for 10 years. I couldn't believe it. I went back home and I sent in the data. I was like, you're teaching interest rates at Oxford University. You've been wrong for 10 years and you haven't even realized you've done it. Because look, they don't get punished. They don't lose money. Yeah. You know, they're getting paid. Like, so these guys, it, may, it upsets me really because, you know, I come from quite a poor area. 
you know, I went to school with like a lot of like recent immigrant kids that was working hard and a lot of them were smart. And, you know, they don't get these opportunities. And then I go to work, you know, in these big skyscrapers in Canary Wharf with people who've been to the top universities. And a lot of them just don't know what they're doing. And it's, it's, it's upsetting. I get upset by it. You know what I mean? But, um, yeah, I mean, I guess it gave me opportunity to, to make the right bets. But, yeah, I think the, these, the, the problem that we have, especially in economics, is like really smart people are not being drawn into the discipline. You know, they only want you if you're like unbelievably good at maths, mm -hmm. which means you, that you tend to attract quite massy brain people who are maybe not very broad minded. They all tend to come from wealthier families. Yeah, man, it, it's upsetting. It's upsetting. But, you know, that's why I'm out there, you know, trying to do my thing, explain to ordinary people what's happening as best as I can. The way you got that job, by the way, when you were saying that at the, at the top of this conversation, the, the thing that I that ultimately pops to mind and it's my favorite movie of all time is um, Pursuit of Happiness. That's what it reminded me of playing a game, one in turn, one job per year. You have to go into a, kind of like a, a, a test to kind of get it. It reminded me of, of that. Yeah, it was it was a mad thing. Like at LSE, suddenly like everyone was sending all these CVs, cover letters and like, you know, it's, it's that classic thing, right? Like I was very, very good student at school, right? Top GCSEs, top A levels. I was good in my exams. But then it comes to like applying for these jobs. And these guys have all got, you know, like I'm a classic concert cellist and I've, you know, <laughs> and because, and you know, they've all got the top grades, you know what I mean? And it's like, oh, you know what I mean? I've, I've been to the Antarctica and stuff on their cover letter. And, you know, I was yeah. working in DFS fluffing pillows, you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's like, you know, the pay for my degree. Um, and it's that classic thing that kids from ordinary backgrounds are getting held away from them jobs because they don't have the connections. They don't have them like hidden bits of knowledge and, um, yeah, obviously, I enjoy the fact that I beat them in a competition, but I was lucky to get that. You know what I mean? Mm. And it's, um, you know, I talk about inequality of wealth, but the way that like ordinary kids are getting like blocked out, you know, obviously, we've had this week in the news, we've had the, the GCC and A-level results, and we've seen kids from private schools do much, much better, even though they didn't do exams. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're just seeing ordinary people getting blocked out at every level. And for, for me, somebody comes from an ordinary background, I want to be able to go into these top jobs and have a diverse group of people there to talk to, you know what I mean? And be able to discuss what's really happening. But, you know, I don't want to just be there with a bunch of rich people saying like, everything's great all the time. And, you know, yeah. I know that gave me opportunity to make money, but like at the same time, the fact is, you know, it's not just finance, you know, nowadays I'm a lot more involved in media. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Media is even worse than finance. It's, everyone <laughs> there is like from a super, super, super rich background. You know what I mean? And it's like, I want to talk about economics. So I went on, I did an interview for times radio and, uh, they put me on against somebody who sound like she'd never left Eton, you know what I mean? And um, <laughs> oh, Eton is a boys' school, so I guess she didn't go there, but you know what I mean? Whatever the female equivalent is. And she was saying, I was saying, look, people are struggling. And she was saying, what do you mean everybody's getting richer? And I was thinking, In your how circle, can you even yeah. say that? How can you even say that? Like these, uh, the problem is that people in the media, it's not people in media, people at the economics departments, universities, people at finance, they all come from that elite circle. And then they're all saying things are fine. So, you know, that's why I'm out here putting videos on YouTube. And, you know, I know you're doing the same. I want to provide a resource for ordinary people to, to hear about economics from somebody who has, you know, I, I understand that I'm rich now, but I grew up poor and I've got friends who are still like that. My family is still like that. Somebody who actually understands it from both sides of the coin. But the problem is, increasingly nowadays, because ordinary people can't get into them top jobs, this, that's hardly anyone. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I did a talk in East London for a boys academy at the East Side uh, Youth Leaders Academy about three weeks ago. And um, so one of my old friends who I used to work with in Canary Wharf, um, he now runs their like curriculum and he goes, you would be a great person to come and speak to the kids given your journey and stuff like that. And little did I know they had someone from the bank, they had the governor of the Bank of England in there, they had about 20 speakers or so. And I didn't know this at the time, but I rocked up and I was like, listen, this is how I managed to get through Canary Wolf. These are the lessons that I've learned in terms of practicality, in terms of, look, you may not necessarily be from the social economic groups of these people, but you, I have, I firmly believe that some, well, it has worked for me anyway, that you have to be able to move between those worlds seamlessly. I just gave him some really practical tips. And, you know, uh, he said to me, the kid really loved it and it resonated because, I looked like them, I sounded like them, and I was pretty much them when I was their age. And I think that's really, really important for, for, for uh, children and kids from 
our kind of background to see examples of this is possible. Because I know there were kids in Tower Hamlet who look at Kune Wolf and think there's absolutely no way that I'm going to end up there. I don't even belong. And I believe that actually I don't have a university degree. How I got a job in, you know, MetLife in Canary Wharf and ended up on the exec team was number one luck, first and foremost, and sheer hard work and learning on on the go how to play the system, how things work and how to position yourself and how to build relationships, how to leverage all those kind of things. They're practical things and tangible things that you learn through the years. And those, I think, need to be passed down to kids so that they can also benefit from them as well. Yeah, for sure. for sure. I mean, I remember, you know, I'm 34 now, but I remember like growing up, like um, you just don't hear like voices like yours, like, you know, and it's not, I'm from London, but I could be from anywhere. Really. I could be from Newcastle. I could be from Manchester. I could be here from Liverpool, you know, like you kind of know when you hear somebody's voice, like whether they had like a very privileged upbringing, you know, and mm-hmm. you just didn't hear like for me growing up, like I just wasn't hearing voices like mine on the TV, you know what I mean? And um. Yeah, I remember like when I was a kid, that was when sort of the grime scene blew up and people like Wiley and Dizzy Rascal yeah. were coming out. And then for me, it was just like, it was amazing just to hear people who sounded like they were from where I'm from. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it was just to hear voices. And, I, you know, I, you know that's why like I try and do what I do. And, you know, I've got like a, a BBC documentary coming out. I, I want to like be on TV, like just, um, it's not for me. It's because I, w- I want young people to be able to, hear voices like mine on TV, you know what I mean? Here on the radio. And it's, it yeah. is important. It, it does it's make so a important. difference. Yeah. yeah. But I'm always sort of torn because I know how difficult it is for young people. Like, and I don't want to like, I don't want to just give like a track message. Like if you work hard, you can do it. Like the, the fact is, if you're from a poorer background nowadays, you need everything. You need to work yeah. hard for sure. You need mm-hmm. to be smart for sure. But the fact is, you need a bit of luck as well. Yeah. You know, I won that game, but you know, it's a bit like, you know, I, I was good at it but I could have lost it on a day. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And like, there's a million little things that could have happened where things could have gone the wrong way. Um, so I think it's like, it's a double message. What I want to send to like younger people is, look, you can do it. You can do it. You need to really work hard to do it. But look, if you do work hard and you don't hit them heights you want to, you need to understand that this system was, was always rigged against you. That doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean you're not smart. The fact is, if you're from an ordinary background, look, I've been there, I've been in the city. There ain't nobody that speaks like me there. You know what I mean? So if you're coming out and you're speaking like me, you're in a difficult position from the start. So wherever you get to, I want you to be proud of where you get to and to understand that if you don't reach the heights of, you know, wherever Boris Johnson's seven kids reach, that doesn't mean you're not as smart as them. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, so just, um, yeah, it's balanced. Look, and, you know, work hard, save your money, do what you can, get property. But, you know, if you don't end up like with a million pound a year job in the city, that doesn't mean that you're not as good as those guys that have that because we have a system, we have a world that, that stops you from getting there. So yeah, do every bit you can, but like, don't beat yourself up if you don't, if you don't catch up with those people that started, you know, 10 miles ahead of you. Uh, man, I, I 100% agree with you on that one. Um, yeah, 100%. I'm on similar paths to you at the minute. I'm trying to do more media stuff because again, it's representation. I want kids to be able to, you know, know where I've got, where I've come from, my background and where I, where I got to and where I am now and in trying to help people. I think that for, I, the way, the thing that gets me excited about it is how inspiring it can be. And I think sometimes you just need someone to light that fuse. And if I could be an example to a young kid who's 16, 17 as that little spark that sets them off, then for me, that would be, that makes all of it worthwhile. I would love to be remembered from a legacy point of view for having inspired people to maybe look at things beyond their immediate environment and dare to just venture. But yeah, I agree with 100% what you just said there, mate. Yeah, I mean, for sure, like, if, if people have seen you and, you know, they feel like there's somebody like me in that kind of space and you're the first person they've seen, like, yeah, for sure, they're going to remember it, yeah. Like I said, I remember, you know, obviously I've not gone on the same career path as people like Did You Ask and Kano, but like <laughs> these were people being successful that spoke like me and that were from where I'm from. And that was the first time that I saw that, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, I used to go down late in Orient and watch the guys, like young guys, you know, I didn't go into football, but I didn't go into music, but just to see like people that speak like you, people that grew up similar to you, that, that know that kind of thing, being successful, like, yeah, it's, it's important. Yeah. So yeah, you yeah, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. You know, so you're doing really well. Lots of people are seeing your stuff. So yeah, keep getting out there, man. 
Now, cheers, man. L listen, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, is there anything that we haven't covered or anything that you want to kind of like add into kind of like closing? I mean, I think we've covered the main stuff. We wanted to talk about like, what is wealth? That's the main thing. Yeah. Just to recap, you know, to understand there's a lot of wealth out there. Um, ordinary people ain't getting it. It's creating an unfair system where rich get richer and, 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 and the poor get poorer. Um, I would like to speak to the older people that to say that maybe own their own property that think they're winning when house prices go up. I would like to say to them, look, think about your kids, think about your grandkids. You know, if house prices go up, that might look good now, but that means your kids and grandkids can't afford the house. You know what I mean? Maybe you're mm -hmm. going to have four grandkids. Maybe you're going to have 10 or they ain't all going to live in your house. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, I would like to say, look, do your thing, do your hustle, work hard, save your money, build up your cash. But at the same time, and you know, I understand because I did that, but at the same time, if you make your money or even if you don't understand that as a group, ordinary people, poorer people are being hurt here. And if we you, you need to come together and push that political side. And I'm, I'm not talking about party political here. You know, you don't need to you don't 100 percent need to vote for the Labour Party or whatever. But push those politicians say, look, I'm going to vote for whoever does something about wealth inequality. Mm -hmm. Seriously demand it, you know. And I think things like Brexit, for example, show, and you know, people think what they like about Brexit, but they show that if enough people demand something, we can get it. Yeah. So let's start demanding a more equal distribution of wealth, man. Make wealth more equal. Don't make it so every single generation, it's just the kids of the rich people mm -hmm. um, who get rich. Yeah, demand and get together. So look, do your hustle, do your thing. But also, especially if you make money, come back and demand that we have a fairer system because otherwise it's our kids and our grandkids who are going to pay. Oh, and also obviously to everyone, check out my YouTube and it's all Gary's yes. economics, YouTube, Twitter, Insta. I'm putting videos out there. Yes, indeed. So there you go, guys. Uh, Instagram, Gary's economics, YouTube, Gary's economics, Twitter, Gary's economics as well. Yeah. Go follow. Um, make sure that you pay attention to what's being said here. Um, I, I was delighted that Natasha actually hooked us up on, on the, on the Instagram because yeah, after watching your stuff, I was like, okay, cool. We definitely, definitely, definitely need to speak, but we are going to have another uh, podcast episode that will come out after this at some point. We've also got a YouTube live session um, actually uh, planned as well. So you can watch us have a conversation just like this one live on YouTube and maybe take, take a few questions as well. But guys, thank you so much for, for listening. And Gary, mate, thank you so much for this conversation. I've, Thoroughly enjoyed this as well. Um, guys, until next week, remember, money's a tool, life is for living. Have an amazing week. Catch you later on.